Hello listeners, uh, or viewers, uh, we're gonna <laughs> start out having to get used to that. Um, welcome to another Free Marketeers vlog. My name is Martin van Staden, I'm joined by Mpiaki Dlamini. Uh, Chris Hatting unfortunately can't join us today because he has a case of the sniffles. Um, but uh, yeah, we have to stick to our schedule. So uh, today we're gonna talk about two topics. Um, you say he has a case of the sniffles, I say he's waging biological war. Oh yes, FMF. yeah, he, he should have stayed home today. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we're gonna talk about two uh, not so feel good topics as we tend to do. Uh, the first being the uh, terrible crime stats that uh, yeah. were released by the, uh, the police, uh, I think yesterday and today. Um, and then uh, talk about economic freedom, which was also the uh, launch of the Economic Freedom of the World report by the Fraser Institute. Also here in South Africa yesterday, um, uh, we had our launch event here at the Free Market Foundation. That will be on our YouTube channel, this YouTube channel soon. And it's also available on our Facebook page. So please, for more detail on economic freedom, please have a look at that. Mm -hmm. Um, we've also put out a media release and Piaki wrote an article, which uh, will be linked in the description below for more detail on that. But yeah, so let's get into crime first. I know there's going to be a bit of a uh, little bit of overlap between these two topics, but uh, let's start with what I consider to be probably the worst uh, statistic. It's murder uh, went up by 3.4%, and that is roughly equal to... 58 murders every single day of the year and apparently weekends are the uh, worst time uh, Idle hands do the devil's work, I guess um, Sexual offenses, uh, rape, sexual assault, etc. went up by 4.6% um, And yeah, I, uh, let me get your view on this uh, at this point in Piaki There's some more notes here about uh, the nonchalant response of our police minister But we can get to that in a second. Yeah. So what do you what do you make of this? This is these are terrible stats. Uh, I mean, this is uh, this, we've been saying this for years, but this is uh, it, it's something that uh, government has just let uh, fester and fester, and it keeps. Okay, so, uh, to be fair to them, there there was a, a long period of where where violent and uh, other crimes decreased, mm. but the fact that they have come, they are st starting to come back up now. I think from last year as well, they started coming back up. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, not 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 good at all. I mean, the South Africans were already um, under siege from crime. We're one of mm -hmm. the most violent places on it. So this yeah. is uh, yeah, yeah. It's uh, <coughs> it's it's quite uh, shocking because uh, Becky Taylor, our minister of police, uh, he's very nonchalant about it. He's saying that um, yes, these statistics, but you well, you you must take into account that it's a very difficult job. And uh, and he said that he specifically emphasized that no heads will roll at SAPS because <laughs> the team is doing a, a good job and we need to be mindful of the fact that uh, that uh, hijackings and cash and transit ice have gone down. So pat on the back for the police on that, even though murder and like silly stuff like that went up. Um, so he says Saps is doing a pretty good job. Um, which, which, which just goes to show you that uh, the, 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 the image we were given by government when this uh, when people were co uh, were protesting this uh, the, the the violence against women mm. and especially the case in, in Cape Town of the of this uh, of this tragic case where a young woman was made at the, at the post office mm. of all places. But uh, when the president came out and said we are going to be serious about crime, mm -hmm. we're going to do everything, to... and then they can't even hire bad, uh, fire the people who are yeah. performing badly at SEPs. This is this is not serious. There is no such thing as tough on crime in South Africa. It's it's quite it's it's shocking. I mean, it's uh, we are the murder and rape capital of the world, and our government is pretty much. I would say okay with that. I, yeah. I think generally, I, okay. I, I, I do think there is something uh, such as tough on crime in South Africa. It's uh, it's you find it in the speeches. Not yes, <laughs> yes, not it's, a, it's a rhetorical toughness. <laughs> yeah, very harsh exactly. words. But uh, so Tele says the SAPS is doing a, a pretty good job. But last year, the commissioner of the police, I think Sitole, said uh, in Parliament that SAP simply cannot yeah. fulfill its mandate. Uh, they they're stretched too thin uh crime is too high they just can't respond to all crimes and i think uh, the statistics are that um something like a hundred uh nine one one nine uh, one oh triple one calls every yeah. day don't go answered or something like that or it's 50 percent and it takes up to two hours for the police to actually respond to your emergency so i mean Yes, uh, I actually have a funny story, but it's funny now because we went past it. I remember someone once broke into our 
uh, like in, into our yard, our family home, into our property. And then we called the police. I think it was New Year's Eve. Then when we called them, they were all drunk. Oh, jeez. That <laughs> is then, amusing, but my goodness, that is sad. And then we had to call my uncle, and then he arrived with, like, you know, a Nopkiri, and a few <laughs> of his friends were also hearing Nopkiris. And you see, and... private sector <laughs> solutions, and yeah. we'll get to that in a yeah. second. Um, yeah, so let's get to that. I mean, Chele, in his very same speech, I think it was the police budget <coughs> speech where yeah. he made, made these interesting comments, he said that the police service can't fight crime alone. It needs a, quote, integrated approach that involves communities. Now, the interesting thing here is that this is the very same person who is trying to disarm yeah. civilians. <coughs> yeah. uh, he is pushing for an amendment to the Firearms Control Act yeah. that will remove self-defense as a valid reason for getting a gun license. So you can still get a gun license, but only if you do sport shooting, if you do hunting, if you're a security guard, it's part of your business. But if you wanted to defend yourself, then tell it as a problem. So I don't know about the uh, this integrated approach with communities. Should they come with uh, top kitties, like you said, and knives? But no, I mean, guns, I, I, no. I mean, I'm, it's better than it would be better than what we currently have with the SEPs, uh, <laughs> and people are already doing those kinds of things, bringing their top kitties. But yeah. it's just. If, if you want to empower communities to defend themselves, it's simple. Yeah. I, I, we would say it's simple at the FMF because obviously communities are made of individuals. Yeah. So if you if you maintain the rights of individuals to bear arms for self-defense, yeah. then those people can, because they form part of communities, they can defend themselves. Yeah. And it's, it, it's, it's amusing that we have to explain such a simple concept. And, and it's, it's quite amazing to me that it's actually something in South Africa that doesn't have a racial aspect. It's exactly. one of the few things. Yeah. I, I've told this story on this podcast before but when i wrote that article about why a free uh, a free society is an armed society last year uh i think i did an interview on power fm yeah and my expectation going into that was that the interviewer was going to like hit back at me yeah. he was going to be totally <coughs> against what i'm saying i f actually i think it was safm and i knew it was a call in yeah. show and i thought everyone was going to say this guy is totally insane yeah. But the interviewer was totally on board, a black guy. He was saying, yes, this is, it's ridiculous that government is even talking about disarming us. Our crime is terrible. And every single person who called in, it was like two white guys, one colored guy, and like four black guys called into that show. And each and every single one of them were totally in favor of firearm rights. All mm. of them said, this government is being preposterous with trying to disarm people when we have crime that is this high. And I just felt, geez, this is actually yeah. the one one of the few things that there you don't people don't divide into white yeah. versus black over, and it's we we agree. But who doesn't agree? Government. Government says we need to disarm uh, people. And I think the survey is run by which we've talked about on this postcard before by the IRR show exactly the same thing that yeah. you're saying now. People, when you ask them to list their top priorities like the, for the problems that they have, it's usually uh, unemployment will be somewhere around the top, mm -hmm. but crime is always yes. constantly on the top. Yeah, yeah. It's never, it, it's it's just one of those issues that there's consensus among South Africans all mm -hmm. over. And I'm, I'm sort of glad this is the case because I think it will be easier to defeat something like you know the amendment you were mentioning to yeah. the fca Absolutely. because yeah we, we can we people can sort of see practically it's, it's yeah. much harder to argue for things like ewc mm -hmm. nhr against ewc nhr mm -hmm. but i think on this we can potentially get a lot of public support yeah. Yeah. no no it's it's actually quite uh, um inspiring to see that yeah, happen no. because finally we agree that government is incompetent and cannot protect <laughs> us so let us protect ourselves and, and, and the, the other stats that came out was that uh, people uh, it was a perception survey asking people which they perceive to be the most corrupt institution in government mm -hmm. and uh, SEPs came out on top so the police the most corrupt institution in government according to ordinary South yeah. Africans that is that is very very concerning um then just i think a few words on the death penalty um i don't i'm not really sure if we agree on this but uh, so the death penalty came yeah. up especially after the uh the rape and murder of yeah. that that student at the post office um i think it's fair to say most south africans want the death penalty back probably i'm not sure yeah. if there is actually yeah. uh, solid data on that but you get the feeling that that is the case i think someone once did a few years yeah. ago and then it, it showed exactly what you're saying now yeah. that the majority supports it yeah yeah and i mean <coughs> we at the fmf or at least i at the fmf um and i think some of the others uh we are totally against that giving yeah. uh government this incompetent government that we have even a measure of power to decide who lives and who dies and i mean everyone says 
No, it's not government, it's the courts. But <laughs> if you look at some of the judgments of our lower courts, which are usually the courts that will make uh, sentences of this kind, high courts, equality courts, then you should be very concerned. Yeah. These judges are some t sometimes emotional. They are too passionate about what's happening yeah. before them. They are not this passionate as they should be. Uh, and I don't think you want the judge to even have the, the availability of the death penalty. I don't know yeah. what your view on this is. I'm 100% I'm with you, Martin, mm. because we have we have seen in the case of free speech, I mean, what if it becomes a thing or like, what if, okay, we, we, we have a, a pretty good system of due process right now, mm. but uh, no, no one would say that it's a perfect system. Mm -hmm. We know this is an open secret. I think that everyone knows that there are, there will be some percentage of people for any crime who are arrested and convicted yeah. based on how or the standard of proofs are set up and everything. Mm -hmm. Who will actually be innocent? It's just unavoidable. There's yes. no way to avoid this problem, yeah. and so it means we'll be killing some innocent people. If it's just even if it's just one person every five years, yeah. No, for me, it's just uh, yeah. there's, uh, for me, it, it it automatically rules out the death penalty, mm -hmm. and then you add in the fact that we have such an incompetent government. Yeah. Yes, uh, I, I think the, the stats bear this out. I mean, uh, the, our um, EW, uh, yeah. EFW launch, uh, the point was made, uh, and it, it's in our EFW statistics, that the impartiality of the courts, the judicial independence, yeah. uh, both of those have declined. Yeah. Now, we're still pretty well. I yeah. think we are amongst like Western nations and I'll independent our courts are but it's declining the trend is not is not good we used yeah. to be one of the top 10 i think uh, uh, in the teens somewhere yeah said, somewhere and said in the teens uh, one to 20 something yeah. somewhere there we used to rank very highly but that the trend is downward ladies yeah. and gentlemen the trend is towards judges who are influenced by politics not not necessarily politicians but politics yeah. ideology um and and i mean uh, the reliability of the police in that same uh, data set uh, basically amongst the worst yeah. in the world um, and law enforcement now this is a, a generally like a, whether people adhere to law and so forth like mm. we rank terribly so i mean my our view i think is quite clear on this definitely no death penalty yeah. in south africa at least not now i think in there can be a principled argument for a death penalty that's something we may disagree on but i think in this case context definitely matters yeah and and i think in south africa's context and in the context of many other countries you need to avoid the death penalty yeah. and I'm, I'm glad to say that at least our courts in the beginning of our constitutional order recognize this and i think the first case of the constitutional court state versus makonyane uh, declared the death penalty unconstitutional and that stands so if government wants to get rid of that they don't need to amend the constitution yeah. and i I'm, I'm not i don't think that's gonna happen so at least i think we will avoid the death penalty yeah and uh, it just the, the, for the final thing uh, so this is we have an incompetent government there is an inherent uncertainty in, in determining guilt but then the final thing is that it's just simply the data does not show that the penalty is a deterrent. It just yes. doesn't yeah. do what it's what people say it's supposed to do. Mm -hmm. So if, it's just no, there's no reason for it. Like it would be trying to, well, it would be trying to solve the wrong problem. There is no, mm -hmm. the, the problem is not that criminals are not afraid mm -hmm. uh, because they are they, they 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 are only just going to go to jail. They won't die, so they they know mm -hmm. that they live in jail. So it's not just that. The, what 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 we know is that I think something like two percent of uh, reported cases to SEPs are ever actually convicted successfully. Yeah. So they know they won't get caught. Exactly. Basically. So yeah. they, so criminals know that uh, I won't get caught. That's, yeah, that's, so that's the simple thing. Yeah. So yeah. It, it, so this this won't solve the problem. You'll mm -hmm. just be killing among the two percent of, yes. of people who actually get caught. Yeah, and it's usually innocent people who <laughs> exactly. aren't running from the police who get caught yeah. when they're falsely uh, accused or there's fake yeah. evidence or something like that. So yeah, it's concerning and I'm glad we're going to uh, avoid the death penalty. But then just to more or less transition from uh, the crime discussion into our EFW, uh, economic freedom discussion, and that is there is a march today at the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. Uh, I emphasize at the JSE, not at the union buildings, not at parliament, yeah. not at the constitutional court, not at the, the, the headquarters of the South African Police Service in Pretoria. There is a march at the JSE by concerned civil society groups who are protesting against uh, gender-based violence. Um, and they are saying, 
the business community needs to come to their assistance. Mm. And uh, and basically now the march has morphed into an anti-capitalism yeah. march. Basically, the unions got involved. I think the, the ruling party's Women's League is involved now. And now this whole thing is becoming an anti-capital, anti-capitalist, anti-commodification, yeah. what, what uh, story. Yet... What do the stats show us, Mpiaki? What, what what we saw yesterday yeah. in countries with a better, so, uh, stronger private sector? So, so, so countries with uh, freer economies, they tend to have lower crimes. Mm -hmm. uh, we are hoping to show that uh, in terms of the actual graph, but we, it will need to be constructed. Fact. But anyway, mm -hmm. so this is... Uh, it, it, uh, the reason why I'm laughing at this idea that people are, are, are marching to the JSC, it's not because uh, the issue that they are... Or, uh, nominally marching for is not it, it is a, a serious issue that all of yeah. us should be concerned about that all of us should do as much as we can to mm -hmm. stop it as just as as much as we should for all violent crime mm -hmm. and for all crime just generally and so this is a, a serious issue it's an important issue to talk about mm -hmm. but they, they they've taken this serious issue and just made it a, 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 an object of ridicule by making it by somehow affixing this anti-capitalism yeah. marxist agenda that they, mm -hmm. they they somehow have because of the association with the unions and yeah. i guess some of the people who who organize the match itself mm -hmm. and so i think that in, for that reason because they've made themselves ridiculous they've taken a serious issue yeah. which and then they've just made it a joke yeah, which yeah. is uh, so you it's more laughing at them than matching uh, laughing at, what, at the issue that which is actually a very yeah. serious issue no yeah. it needs to be solved it's it's true i mean but the, in south africa the only measure of safety that we do have is because the of the private yeah. sector because of big security yeah. companies because of big uh, companies that do uh, uh what do you call it um uh safety the, yeah. the thing, word escapes me the stuff around your house, the electrical uh, fencing, right? Yeah, electrical right. Private fencing. Comp private yeah. security companies, It's all companies, private. Yeah. The government does nothing uh, really in, in the end of the day to, to secure us. Um, and yet now we're going to the private sector yeah. saying you are contributing to this or you're not doing enough, which is probably what they're saying, which is... It's absurd. It is uh, totally absurd. It, it's what in I, like I couldn't believe what I was reading. Some of them were actually saying like violence is generated by the capitalist system. Oh. It creates violence. It just it's it's complete nonsense. I mean, if in South Africa the private sector, private security companies were given the same powers as the police, if private companies were allowed to conduct uh, prosecutions in court, as long as I don't understand this. If, if if you provide evidence to a court and it's acceptable to a judge yeah. who is appointed by the state, yeah. not by the private companies, even though the prosecutor might be a private company, yeah. why, 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 why would anyone be against that? Yeah, yeah, it shouldn't be a problem. We have private prosecution in South Africa yeah. and it's very rare, but when it does get accepted, the same rule is applied to the yeah. private prosecutor as to the national uh, prosecuting authority. The evidence must be admissible, it must be good weighted evidence, and if it isn't, then it gets thrown yeah. out. So it's it's the same thing and i i personally think that if we had a private based prosecution system um we'd probably be more effective because yeah, because you the the prosecutor has an interest yeah. in, in actually a, a sometimes a very personal interest in, in get, doing doing the case well and and the idea that the prosecutor needs to be impartial is a, it's a myth to yeah. me uh, because the prosecutor even a state prosecutor is never impartial they get involved in that case yeah. emotionally uh, so that's nonsense the judge needs to be impartial not yeah. not the parties exactly. to the case exactly yeah. so i mean i i wish we could insert imagine if in south africa if let's say you've been hijacked you can hire your own prosecutor hire, yeah. hire your own private security company to go after the guy who stole your car yeah i mean it, it would be a, i mean i think very quickly criminals will soon realize that the incentives for crime yes uh, I, um, I have declined by a, a great deal mm -hmm. because i think that two percent number of convicts convictions would, would would shoot up Absolutely. astronomically yeah, yeah. because uh, there would be the right incentives you know that if you don't uh catch the criminals if you don't convict if you don't get them convicted in court and thrown in jail mm. then you won't get paid yeah and so there, there will be the incentives to actually no. do the job that government is currently failing to do mm -hmm. and so this is uh the idea that capitalism generates conflict is an old mm -hmm. marxist idea as you yeah. know as you know martin like it, it's never shown to be true anywhere and mm -hmm. like we and this is the why the efw is relevant to yeah. show that correlation because there's really no correlation between there's they you actually see the opposite yes. that's more economic freedom more capitalism leads to safer societies yeah. and this is like this should make a sense to any normal mm -hmm. uh joe on the streets i mean look at countries like the usa which are some of the freest in the world yes. hong kong mm -hmm. singapore always the lowest crime rates exactly yeah. 
So this is, it, it, I think it's a, it's a no-brainer. Some of the proposals, like a two-person tax on all JSE companies, <laughs> are just ridiculous. Okay, there is a uh, funding problem in the criminal justice system, yes. but the funding problem is caused by government diverting funds mm-hmm. from the for its core functions, which includes protecting you and your property, mm. uh, diverting funds from there to welfare and uh, paying salaries of its employees. Yeah, so that's I, the problem. And I mean, uh, South African Express, I think two days ago, received another 300 million rand guarantee exactly uh, basically <laughs> saying that if they cannot repay their debt up to 300 million rand government will pay it for yeah. them how how convenient so the SOEs so, are, are draining funds from all yeah. the important imagine, the SOEs welfare civil servants imagine what yeah. 300 million rand could do like in the hands of a private security firm for instance yeah. I mean that is some serious uh, tre- uh, treader there that you can use to to fight crime and, and really secure people but uh, yeah so veering into the EFW mm-hmm. I mean um, we had our launch here in South Africa yesterday of the Economic Freedom of the World report. That is all. Oh, I don't know if the report itself is available for download yet, but as soon as it is, no, we it is, will yeah. let everyone know. Um, so South Africa is continuing its decline. Um, we reached our peak in the year 2000. I think we were number 47 about. Yeah. Uh, uh, in the world, so the closer to one you are, the uh, freer you are economically. So after apartheid, the government really liberalized everything, uh, the A- the ANC government, um, and uh, control boards were abolished, we privatized uh, ISCOR, uh, all these things happened, we had economic growth, I, what, what was the highest economic growth we had in those days, 5%? I, th- I think it was around 6%, yeah, 6%. I, think, I think we had a one year where we reached 6%, or a few yeah. years where we reached 6%. And, and this was all after the, the transition out of apartheid, when we had economic freedom, we reached our peak of economic freedom in 2000 since then we've been declining and it, it really nosedived i think from 2008 thereabouts and now we are number uh, 101 yeah. um and uh, we share the neighborhood of countries like turkey and uh, greece which their economy has totally collapsed uh and it's 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 not a good place to be yeah. um uganda Uganda has overtaken South Africa, Nigeria has overtaken South Africa, Kenya has overtaken South Africa. All of these countries are increasing their economic freedom. Um, and yeah, we're, we're not in a good place now. I don't know what you make of, of our, uh, our trend. Well, I, all the countries that you mentioned have overtaken South Africa. I think it's just it's simply because they, they want to get wealthy. I think South Africans have decided that they are tired of wealth. Yes. They, they, they want to try poverty now. Yeah. Because I think for uh, for the for the longest time, we were one of, if not the actual uh, wealthiest country on the continent. And so I think South Africans have just decided, no, they are, they are sick of that. And then the countries that, that have never experienced this, like Kenya, they, they want some of this. So they are, they, are, they are reforming their policies. I mean, even Nigeria. Nigeria, I think Neil showed this yesterday as well. It, it was languishing for around 110, 120, yeah. exactly in the area that South Africa is currently in for the longest time. But mm-hmm. they just decided, no, we are sick of this. Yes. We need to improve our economy. And they started fixing it. And now they yeah. are, they've exceeded us. I mean, Rwanda, mm-hmm. all of these countries, uh, Mauritius, which is the top country on the continent, I think it's joined yeah. ninth. Yeah, it, I mean, it takes a conscious decision yeah. by not only the political class, but by people in general to decide... Uh, I understand that me being freer from government mm. is going to lead to my own prosperity uh, and definitely decide against taking property rights. I mean, that is the uh, the area I think we perform the worst in. Mm. Uh, our our uh, The EFW is divided into areas which they measure to uh, determine the rank and one of them is legal system and property rights and a subset of that is the protection of private property. And I think that is where we fared yeah. the worst and I think... I think next year's EFW, which will measure 2018, will be the the the, the fall in property rights there. I think will be in extreme because yeah. that is the time when expropriation of out compensation really burst onto the scene. That is when the new expropriation bill was proposed, and I think a lot of this is based on survey data. Yeah. Uh, so I think there you'll see a massive nosedive where people say, "Yeah, I have no more confidence that my property is going to yeah. be secure in South Africa." And I mean, we've seen like agriculture has declined, I think, twenty five percent in in productivity over the last yeah. two years. So I mean, none of this is uh, a surprise. But what is surprising is that South Africa did better with hiring and firing apparently uh, uh in in this in this year's efw but uh yeah neil couldn't really explain that yeah. but it's probably due to other countries 
uh, moving up the ranking and we were just pushed down uh, without I think, it actually I think, getting I think there were some uh, some minor reforms made to the labor laws which might explain it I remember reading something about yeah. that that there were some reforms that they made but it's a uh, it's it was very limited reforms yeah. And it was uh, it's been a while now i mean this year we just had the national minimum wage bill passed yes and then we also had this debt relief bill and so imagine the, the efw two years from now <laughs> yes <laughs> what is going to be yeah where our labor ranking is gonna totally uh, yeah. fall apart um but then just to like get into some of the the i think the key points that the efw makes and it uh, every year is basically the same but this year i have some numbers um if you are in the poorest 10 percent of the population mm. in a extreme capitalist society with total economic freedom or as close as you can be you will earn on average ten thousand six hundred and forty six dollars uh, per annum per year um, and if you live in a country where the government takes very good care of you and where it's always trying to make sure that you're protected you will get a thousand five hundred and three dollars every year so you will live in extreme destitution yeah. in the countries where government takes a very active role in the economy which is where south africa is going and in countries where government stands back and says no i'm going to stay uninvolved you are an individual with personal responsibility take care of yourself that is where you will be the richest and most wealthy and uh yeah so the 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 standard of living for the poorest people in society is higher in uh, an economically free country yeah. uh, and i mean uh, neil made this point and i think your article is specifically about inequality yeah. um, but i found his point to be to be great um that inequality is the same everywhere basically so even in the richest countries and even in the poorest countries uh the the, the most economically free countries and in the most economically unfree countries the difference between uh, the rich and the poor is not that great so that means that even if you dedicate government fully to solving inequality mm. it's not going to work because it hasn't worked anywhere even in the most communist states of the past even it's it's exacerbated yeah. poverty in some cases um but inequality is not the problem uh, there is some other reason why people live in destitution and not it's not just because there's a a difference between them and the rich i don't know what what your take is on that so uh yeah i i need neil, neil's point was that uh you, like capitalism doesn't cause inequality yeah. the most unequal countries i think are the ones in the dead court mm. so that, that's what my article was about it was examining this strange thing when you look at the data that's the first quartile which is the freest countries or, or, or in the world yeah. are not the most un unequal, yes. unequal the second freest countries in the world are not the most unequal it's actually the dead freest countries like the dead quartile of the yeah, not, not the last but not the, the last, last. The, yeah, yeah the second to last and so this is this was sort of uh, me sort of mm. speculating what could be causing this mm. and the sort of answer that i uh, ended up coming up with a tentative answer of course it will require more research is that uh, in in the in the first quartile because people are so free there's a lot of dynamism people mm. can you, you can rise up from the very bottom and get to the very top pretty cleanly yeah. and this is still roughly true in the second quartile those countries are still relatively free i think you have countries like uh, Denmark and uh, Scandinavian countries, a lot of them are in the second quartile. Yeah. And then in the third quartile, where South Africa is, it tends to have the most unequal countries, countries like Brazil, mm -hmm. South Africa, and I. I'm not if i'm not mistaken i think russia also but i would need to check that mm. but so this the the interesting thing there is that this the, this dead quartile countries is uh, also the countries with the most cronyism so they mm. they tend to be they tend to be countries with mixed economies tightly regulated uh, in some cases highly taxed like south africa mm -hmm. and there these countries they through this tight uh, regulation they are able to extract rents so there's a lot of corruption because you know bureaucrats have a lot of discretionary power as mm. you have made in, in your rule of law uh, articles and uh, mm. writings martin so this is uh so this allows the, they there's something to steal because they some private yes. sector so yeah. they, they so they tend to be the, the wealth accrues to those who are politically connected stealing from the productive mm. parts of the economy and then in the in the fourth quarter there are no productive parts of the economy <laughs> or very few very yep. limited parts very of it expected, yeah. exactly and it's all dominated it tends to be almost all dominated by the states countries like cuba venezuela yeah. so every, everyone is equally poor so there's yeah, no exactly. real inequality exactly yeah. so there is no like they there is some inequality in the terms that some politicians yes. tend to yeah. be much wealthier than everyone else Always but other than case. that yeah. other than that there is like no real 
across country inequality mm -hmm. because of those reasons. So th th that was the, what that article was about. Yeah, mm. and I mean, uh, that really shows us what government should be focusing on. We need to get ourselves out of the third quartile uh, if, we, if we want to solve inequality, which I still submit is not a problem. The problem is the poorest of the poor do not have money to put food on the table. Yeah. That is the problem. We need to uplift them instead of pulling other people yeah. down, which is people who are rich are not the problem. The problem is poor. There are people who are poor. Yeah. Um, and uh, the mini budget is coming up. And I re read an article in uh, News 24. Uh, I cannot recall the author's name, but he's saying that it can't be business as usual. Now, I know. I agree that, with him. Yeah. Yeah. And in, in the uh, in the mini budget, you can't really come up with new policy, but there's not, no there's no hard and fast rule that says you need to stick to everything. It's yeah, basically yeah. convention. And and I mean, this is this should be seen in the context of Moody's, which has very interestingly said told South Africa, we're not going to downgrade you. Uh, to your investment grade, mm -hmm. we're going to give you another chance because we think your debt is going to stabilize, which, I mean, that's interesting. I probably would have downgraded South Africa years ago. But, but, but you know, <laughs> you have to understand, Moody is yeah. saving two groups of people, saving yeah. its customers, which include the South African government. Right. It's also saving the people who subscribe to his products would be, would be international investors. Yeah. And so if, when Moody's looks at South Africa, they probably see, okay, there's a lot of... Um, domestic as domestic savings base so if the mm. government is really in trouble they can just pass a law oh, and, and, and 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 take like you know use something like prescribed assets oh, that's horrific. so the in investors who, yeah. who 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 trust our products they can still get their money back even ah. though south africans will be so uh, if you yeah. look at it like that you sort of understand why they haven't downgraded us yet. okay okay that, that, i guess that makes sense but i i think uh uh, there's an opportunity with the mini budget uh, for uh, our somewhat lucid Minister of Finance to come out and say, okay, guys, we've played this game with mm. uh, national health insurance, we've toyed with prescribed assets, uh, we're increasing regulation, but no, we're, we're done with that. We are going to cut expenditure, yeah. which is what this article that I read also makes a point. There, there needs to be a cut in government expenditure, yeah. uh, a, a significant cut. Our public sector wage bill, which contributes to our decline in the rankings and economic freedom, needs to get down. We need to get rid of civil servants who get paid to do basically nothing. Yeah. Um, we need to uh, um, get rid of some state-owned assets like uh, ESCOM. Uh, Mbueni came up with the idea that ESCOM should sell some of its power plants. Yeah great idea that should absolutely happen rather than closing them down sell them maybe the private sector yeah. can upgrade them and then bring them back uh, back up to speed uh, so there are real practical solutions to yeah. our problem that can be implemented right now and much of it in the ministry of finance yeah. that Boweni does have actual power over yeah. and that can actually uh, uh, lead to us climbing the ranking of economic freedom i don't know if you have no, I, I, I think uh, minister Boweni has an opportunity uh, to sort of uh, continue uh, showing what the, the kind of uh, finance minister he is or what he stands for or to show that he understands the problems that South Africa has. Yeah. I mean, the, the most uh, significant thing he's done so far is release this document for comment. Mm. It hasn't been approved by parliament. This new policy that Treasury released for, for, our, for the benefits of our viewers, uh, Treasury policy was released last week on the economic growth in South Africa. And so it, it has uh, uh, some good proposals. And so if those want to, if the government wants to those implemented, then it's a chance for the minister to show it in the budget speech, mm. in, the, in the spending bills that he, he presents to parliament. I mean, the easiest thing to cut is just simply to stop funding SOEs. Yes. I think that's, um, they, even though there is, there is some union opposition to that idea, but I think it's much harder to fire civil servants or to cut welfare. So mm. I, I would think politically, the easiest thing for the minister to do would be to say, okay, uh, to set a commitment, which he has done many times and broken, to say that we will not be funding these uh, unsustainable organizations. Yeah, you broke it two days ago exactly. by giving a 300 a million rand yeah. guarantee to South African yeah. Express right after he said there will be no more money. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know if he's being pressured by his colleagues. Probably there's some of that, yeah. but he yeah. really needs to stand on principle on this because that is really the only way for us to pull ourselves out of this so, quagmire. So if, if you as a finance minister say that the country is in trouble and then every solution to the problem is being rejected, yeah. then he it, it's no use. Uh, like, uh, what's, what's the point of sort of appeasing people who want nothing but destruction of the country? Yes. So at some point, you just have to stand on principle or and even possibly resign if it yes. comes to that yeah. so this is this is what the minister needs to think think about i mean we 
I think uh, I, I, we generally don't have a problem with the minister here. And like we like a, a lot of his proposals, a lot of his pronouncements, but he needs to show it in something concrete. Yes. He needs to present a bill to parliament saying, hey, guys, this, we can't just be business as usual. We have to cut yeah. spending. And this is what I'm proposing to you. We'll cut spending in these areas. We'll do this. We'll do that. And so if, if, if unless he does that, and I think the medium term budget is, is absolutely the place to do that if yeah. he wants to show that you are in crisis mode. Yes. I mean, there is no, there's nothing in the law. The medium term budget statement just allows government to to adjust spending over the next three years. It, there is no hard rule preventing them from yeah. making major policy changes yes. in during that medium term period. Yeah. It will basically just say, okay, in, in February, I didn't realize the extent of the problem. Now yes. I realize that this is a much bigger problem. Yeah. So in October, I'm adjusting the expenditure over the next three years and mm -hmm. saying we are going to cut much more radically. Yeah. That's all he needs to do. Yeah. Now, one of the big things is he needs to say, and I mean, say it unequivocally, yeah that we cannot afford NHI. We do not have yeah. 400 billion rand a year lying around at SARS. And no way to raise just, it. Yeah, there's there's no money to, to there is no more taxpayers yeah. to, to uh, sap dry. Uh, we're over the Laffer curve. Uh, people are leaving, com companies are divesting. Mm. People aren't even improving their own property anymore because of expropriation without compensation. So there's no money lying around for NHI. You can print the money, but that, <laughs> that's gonna that's gonna lead to its own <laughs> own problem. Yeah. So don't don't even go there. Um, so we don't have that money. Uh, we need to cut spending, and we need to cut future spending, which is the NHI. I think is probably the yeah. the the elephant in the room. And I mean, it sounds great. Uh, everyone thinks yes, we need universal healthcare, but it simply cannot happen. It cannot happen right now in South Africa, and probably cannot happen for yeah. the next century <laughs> probably and unfortunately but we we cannot even talk about this because we're not funding the police enough we're not funding uh, the military enough the core functions of the state have basically collapsed yeah. because the state is throwing money at things that it cannot hope to afford yeah. and things that it is totally and utterly incompetent at delivering so we have a very necessary philosophy shift uh, in South Africa that we need to go through it seems it's, it's going to be painful that is, but it needs to that, happen that, that's the only way Martin like what you said now the philosophy shift that needs to happen I mean this uh, uh, the, the women's march to the JSE is a ridiculous example of this philosophy shift that's required mm -hmm. I mean the people that are, are basically holding holding the country together right now as the government does everything it can to destroy it. Yes. Those are the people that we want to march against. Yeah, yeah. Which is which, which is interesting in terms of the psychology of what's going on. Mm -hmm. I remember I, I last night I had occasion to look at uh, like the CIPC app on mm -hmm. the on the on the Android Play Store and the, 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 at the reviews everyone hated it it had like one stars this is the government app for registering your business and one of the comments in the reviews really caught my eye because the guy was saying that how come this is the only company that registers companies in South Africa like the lack of competition is killing us <laughs> exactly <laughs> exactly yeah the, the, and the government monopolizes everything it touches yeah. and then the competition commission doesn't say anything about it so yeah it's it's a fair point we we need the private sector to compete so I think it I I think it shows that people are sort of understand intuitively that you need competition for things to work well people yeah. need to have the right incentive to know that someone else can take the money that was going to come to them if they don't do their job properly yes and and this is the, this this is the simple point the fmf has been making i think since its founding which is just simply to say that this is the benefits of the private sector mm. people are competing each against each other for you to give them your money voluntarily yes. yeah. government just takes it and it's there's no competition they take it and they use it yes. however they want yeah. and so this is this is the moral difference between the private sector and the government and i think it needs to be made much more clearly it's just a pity our objectivist is not here <laughs> yes no you, you would definitely have something to say about uh defending the, yeah. the morality of of making money yeah. and the fact that that just leads to everyone being uplifted at the end of the day and, and government cannot do that not it's not in its nature yeah. but yeah i think that is a good note to end on the superiority of the free market over a state-led <clears throat> economy and we see this in practice we see this in the data there is no there is i hate saying that it's not debatable because i like a good argument but it's basically not debatable if you want south africa to be yeah. uplifted you need to free the economy and well idiots will radical. debate it but yes they will debate it but it's not debatable yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah so uh please remember to subscribe to this youtube uh, channel it is the big red button right under the video 
uh, like our page on Facebook, that is Free Market Foundation South Africa or uh, in the URL facebook.com slash FMFSA. Follow us on Twitter at FMF South Africa. And always remember to visit our website uh, www.freemarketfoundation.com. Uh, thanks for tuning in and we'll see you again next week. Cheers.